So we are going to start, I think. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here and participating today in our APP seminar. So today we have with us uh, Luis Lenner. Luis is currently faculty chair at the Perimeter Institute. Luis has a vast experience in strong gravity and numerical relativity as seen in the numerous citation of articles published in prestig prestigious scientific journals. Through his academic years, he has been dedicated to the study of different topics. For instance, the studying systems, systems are able to produce a strong gravitational and electromagnetic signal, tests of alternative theories of gravity, and how to do with a common gravitational wave detector, understand, understanding gravitating system and higher dimensional scenarios, exploration of ADS and CVT in dynamical setting, ADS CVT turbulence, relativistic hydrodynamics and gravity, jets from binary black hole, final state of gravity, Laplace instability, and multi messenger astronomy. He got his PhD in physics from the University of Pittsburgh in 1998 under the supervision of Jeff Winnicott. Afterward, he moved to the Department of Physics and Astronomy for the Louisiana uh, State University in USA in 2002. And since 2009, <coughs> he has been working at the Perimeter Institute. He has received multiple awards. Furthermore, he is a fellow in many societies, such as fellows of International Society for General Relativity and Gravitation, and American Physical Society fellow. So, thanks, Luis, to be here, and we're going to start wherever you want. Oh, thank you, Miguel, for that too kind of an introduction. And um, okay, so let's just uh, jump right in. Hope everyone is safe, and uh, hopefully, this area we're living uh, ends soon enough. But in the meantime, we're going to do the best we can uh, online. Uh, my experience so far is that online talks are still uh, are not uh, in anywhere near the experience uh, that we have uh, in with in phase one. So by all means, uh, do stop me at any point. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or anything. The talk is a bit open ended. Uh, I'll be watching my the time. Um, so uh, just let's see where, how far we go. There are a whole bunch of points I would like to make, but I'll, I'll try to establish them early on and then give you reasons why I believe uh, things I, I present. So of course the motivation, everyone uh, here would agree. I mean, there are many arguments to, uh, in some sense, consider extensions from GR, maybe because uh, we're uh, definitely uncomfortable with the fact that we have singularities in the theory. Um, we may be uncomfortable with the uh, need to introduce dark matter or dark energy. Uh, there are plenty of reasons, from academic to very practical ones. So um, that's a given. Uh, we are fortunate living uh, very interesting times with respect to the data that we're uh, getting from all sort of uh, uh, venues, for, from electromagnetic uh, signals of, say, binary pulsars, tests uh, in the solar system, et cetera. But very recently, uh, adding uh, the ability to analyze gravitational waves, um, uh, use VLBI to examine the very, very close region of a black hole in, 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 in galaxies, et cetera. And in particular, especially in the context of, say, gravitational waves, uh, we have the ability to uh, test the nature of gravity in the context of very highly dynamic regimes where the speed uh, of, uh, of the propagations of the objects that source gravitational waves are close to the speed of light. They're strongly gravitating systems. And well, depending on which systems we're thinking about, we uh, also have access to very strong curvature regimes, not so much in the case of supermassive black holes, but it definitely in the case of stellar black holes. And in general, if we're going to be searching for potential deviations from general activity, this, that search would be suboptimal without uh, some sort of guidance from the theoretical front. And eventually also the analysis will be incomplete without guidance. And by that, I mean the, the amount of physics we can get out uh, from a search that was perhaps guided phenomenologically after, if, if it is the case that we end up detecting deviations, we would like to turn that around and, and try to see what that tells us about the nature of gravity. And that's where uh, theory will, will come and have something to say. So one thing I want to set up uh, from the very beginning is not 
one of my goals here to advocate for or analyze any particular theory, even though I will be presenting some uh, particular results of particular theories, by no means I'm trying to say that I have any reason to believe that those theories are the most important or the least important. I'm just uh, using them to uh, uh, illustrate some of the issues I've been worrying and, and uh, I and others have been worrying for a while. So the goals will be instead to discuss issues that one has to bear in mind when considering any possible extension, illustrate that such issues do arise. They are not just uh, a figment of uh, maybe two an anal uh, Thai mathematician or something that, wants, that is looking for trouble. The issues are there and potentially will arise and will have consequences. And I hope at the end to say, well, maybe there are options to plow forward, even in the presence of those, of those problems, um, because of something I'll say later on. So to set just a stage, one always, at least, uh, and Enrico will know very well, I mean, I, I have been dragged into, or I got myself into the extensions of GR question, not because I like it, it was just, maybe kicking and screaming, I went in there because I always have the problem of, are we going in that direction because we're simply interesting, inventing interesting problems to solve or because we have a, a, a really powerful result to go and, and look for potential deviations in any particular way. Um, of course, on the other hand, even if one takes that, uh, uh, there are very interesting motivations from the theoretical point of view, from the academic point of view, even if we know for a fact that GR turns to be the correct uh, theory to the level that we're, uh, we're probing uh, observationally. Just to learn in some sense what happens in alternative options where maybe the theory of gravity has other polarizations and other potential uh, effects, uh, it's always interesting to, to look elsewhere and find out the limitations of the, th the theory that uh, we may know works in these regimes. So, I, every now and then I'll, I'll make this comment, um, and this is a terminology that uh, both Franz Pretorius and I have been using for a while, and I've been trying to introduce, that we have to sometimes uh, tell or use two distinguishing terms. So, so a modified theory could be uh, called interesting uh, if it is consistent with every existing test of generativity that we have so far, but may offer observable differences in the strong field. So in that case, it would be interesting, it would be something that potentially could be exploited with observations to rule out or learn new, uh, new physics. But a modified gravity, we could want to call it viable if it possesses a well-posed initial value formulation that can be solved to make concrete predictions to confront with data. And it's not clear that um, both the interaction of those, the interesting and viable sets uh, is um, non-zero a priori. So, we also have, of course, very powerful reasons to think that whatever modification is out there, it should be such that uh, doesn't have very, very strong deviations as, uh, in the observables from those in GR because we have data um, so far that is uh, quite consistent with general activity to within some interesting uh, uh, relative error. Of course, when one uh, approaches the problem, so what, what, if there are modifications where, where those modifications should be, so in particular it could be uh, trying to explore modifications of the coupling between matter uh, and geometry, and I'll show an example. Um, one could consider modifying the geometry part, which in some sense to be the left-hand side of the equations, maybe with having further degrees of freedom, relaxing some particular symmetries or principles of nature that have been used to build uh, general relativity. Or one can imagine th modifying things in the right hand side by exploring exotic alternatives to say black holes or neutron stars. And of course, if there is a little bit of matter of taste here, what one puts in the left hand side, maybe what someone else wants to put in the right hand side and it's just a relabeling of terms when at least considering some perturbative uh, uh, analysis with respect to specified solutions. And I'll say once again, that we have strong anchors. So, so uh, general relativity, so far, even uh, observing black holes and neutron stars shows that they can do a very good job describing the systems in as far as we've been able to tell. And so there's a very powerful idea is to use effective field theories approach 
to try and understand potential corrections to Einstein's equations through the additions of further operators that typically include higher derivatives, some new scales, uh, and of course some key, key assumptions built in in this EFT to try and, and capture potential deviations. So here, if there are some points I want to make, so I'm, I want to stress this part. Uh, so there are some underappreciated issues uh, and maybe some overrated issues. So let me just tell you a few things. Um, and the reason some of this underappreciation comes for uh, into this problem, because this interesting question of exploring deviations from general activity has brought in people or practitioners from very from different corners of physics, from cosmology, general activity, particle physicists, and others. And everyone comes with this natural uh, bias and baggage of tricks. And what works in one corner might not necessarily work in another. So let me just explain a few things uh, on why is it that I think we need to uh, be conscientious of these issues. So what is the concept of linearization stability? Um, it is, which, this is a mathematical term, which means that if you take a system of equations, you linearize it, and you find the solutions to the linear problem, a problem is said to be linearly stable if that solution is consistent with the solution that one obtains in the for dealing with the full problem in the linearized regime. It is not clear in general that that is a given. And I'll give you an example. Take Navier-Stokes and I'll continuously go, we go into the Navier-Stokes because it's, it has been a uh, useful motivating uh, beacon in, in the past for, for some of these ideas. So take Navier-Stokes and linearize it with respect to say a constant solutions. Uh, and I'll give you an example uh, in, in more detail later. Uh, you'll find that all modes decay. There is no turbulence whatsoever. Um, However, that's if you linearize. If you look at the solution of the full problem, even when you take a very small perturbation, but you solve it in full, you'll find out that it will be turbulence. Uh, long wavelength modes will be subject to turbulence. And, and so that's an example where, well, depending on what the question you're trying to ask, uh, in looking at the linearized problem might not give you the full picture. In the context of EFT, people often talk about regime of applicability. So you imagine a given theory, you uh, add corrections to that, uh, and the assumption is that higher order operators or corrections should stay small. The moment you get out, the moment you naturally go to a regime where those corrections grow um, to significant size, then what you should be doing is to say, oh, the EFT approach has uh, has broken, you've gone beyond the regime of applicability, you have no right to keep asking that EFT to give you answers. So that, that is an interesting uh, uh, topic uh, in its own right. And we know that, let's say take GR again, and just add to it any operator uh, that you think is a correction. We know that already generativity, your leading uh, part um, has in itself very, very different regimes. We know uh, we have uh, theorems that establish the stability of Minkowski. So if we perturb Minkowski uh, with the right set type of perturbation, we're going to give uh, get back Minkowski asymptotically. And at the same time, general relativity allows for singularity theorems. So we know that other set of initial data will invariably lead us into a singularity. So this is a, a single theory, just general relativity, where the regime, the type of initial data you uh, propose to study could take you in two very, very different directions. So you could very well imagine an EFT uh, approach that adds corrections to general activity uh, will be perfectly well behaved around the type of data where Minkowski is stable, but definitely not around the type of data where singularity uh, will, will show up. And we have to be mindful of, uh, of this. So it may very well be that at the end of the day, any interesting or viable and both uh, options to modify GR will not be the theory by itself, but will be the theory with strong constraints on the type of initial data that you should consider to claim one thing or another. And 
So on the flip side, there are some overappreciated issues or, or overrated uh, statements. So one uh, that is very commonly found, again, depending on which context and which corner of the world you're in, uh, is the following, the, uh, I, the, un the belief that uh, as long as your equations of motions are second order, which then can show that uh, there wouldn't be uh, the existence of this Ostrograskis ghost, then you're good. And in fact, whole sets of theories have been built under that very strong requirement. But that's not sufficient. You could have, and I'll show you uh, explicit examples of cases where you have second order equations and your theory uh, will break down. So uh, the lack of Ostrograsky goes is a necessary condition, but by far is not sufficient. And there is another one that is often uh, thrown out there, especially coming, if you want, from, from high energy arguments, that you could ex approach these corrections in some sort of reduction of order strategy where you take those uh, higher terms, you assume they will be small, and you can solve the equations perturbatively, and you're good. Again, I'll show you some examples where that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so any questions so far? Now let's start digging deep into these issues. So I guess if there are no questions, um, let me just give you some examples. So in the past, uh, lots of people, some of us uh, as well, so including uh, Enrico Barause, Carlos Valenzuela, Steve Lieblin, we have explored some of these theories that you would consider both viable and interesting. So these are the scalar tensor theories that are Damour and Esposito Farese uh, building over also work, prior work um, have uh, built. These are interesting and viable theories that do give rise to measurable departures, potential measurable departures from general relativity in the context of say binary neutral stars where some phenomena called scalarization uh, brings in an extra char potential charge in the uh, neutron stars, which have an appreciable uh, effect in the, in the dynamics and, of course, on observable counterparts, uh, because you can have uh, a phenomena like dipole radiation uh, taking place. Um, more recently, people have been able to kind of mimic or modi uh, or introduce. Uh, some specially designed potentials that will show, uh, will induce some uh, similar variations or, or differences in the context of binary black holes, but arguably uh, those were introduced by looking for a particular phenomena to be real. Uh, it's not necessarily, I would not necessarily call that natural, but it's, they're there. In the context of, um, this is in the context of a theory where you add an extra degree of freedom model by a scalar field, you could also introduce a vector field, and then this is a theory that is called, or one of them is called einstein maxwell dilaton that comes naturally in some corner of string theory. But again, to have some interesting deviations, uh, you need black holes with a very large uh, effective uh, charge or some very uh, large effective cosmological constants. And, and you would then argue, okay, you're, you're, you're going to a corner that maybe is not natural in the theory for uh, the possible variations. But in, in a nutshell, this family of theories would be the only ones, uh, or among the potentially only ones, where it would be viable and potentially interesting. But by and large, once you go beyond that, then problems do begin to arise. And, and I'll, I'll describe those as I go around. So let's consider going to um, a more general class of scalar tensor theories. And these are come under uh, the vein of Kordensky theories, which are the most general uh, theories that you can write, uh, which contain an extra degree of freedom given by the scalar field. And that at the end of the day will give rise to second order equations. So this is an example of what I was saying before, the, the, uh, the the goal of having uh, equations that are, do not have higher than second order uh, uh, derivatives uh, has um, profoundly affected the, the theoretical search. And you have this very large family that's potentially very interesting. And in some sense, it's, um, the, it's natural as in, 
in response to some questions that are uh, out there. For instance, in the context of cosmological question co uh, uh, questions, sorry, that's in, in the context of in the context of uh, of trying to ask how would the cosmological constant arise and have that value, you can accommodate that if you assume like this scatter field somehow gets to evolve to a regime where it has a particular norm. If that norm has a right uh, value, then it can mimic the cosmological constant. So it's a very natural way to incorporate some interesting um, uh, issue that we're struggling with in theory. Um, you can also accommodate the characters on theories I, 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 dis I discussed before, but of course it contains many more uh, variables um, and, and potential phenomena. Another thing you could have in here, and this also ties to some very interesting work that actually uh, comes from the Trieste region, um, Creminelli and, co and, and collaborators. Uh, you could have phenomena like um, uh, gravitational effects being weakened, and so you can have bounce in the context in the context of bouncing cosmology theories like these naturally uh, accommodate uh, the, that very interesting idea. And mo lots of studies have been made uh, of this theory with consequences that have been tested uh, against cos cosmological data or the data uh, related to cosmology measurements. However, most of those analyses have been done under the assumption of, uh, uh, of doing perturbations with respect to particular solutions. You take FRW, you perturb that, obtain the linearized equations, and then you run and, and obtain consequences. But it's not clear, as I said before, that this theory in general, or even in these particular regimes, satisfies the criteria of linearization stability. So all results that could have been obtained there, having, been, having linearized the equations, did not be the same results you would obtain if you take the full equations and look at the uh, consequences in a, in a scenario that you would call linear with respect to some given perturbations. And this has been, uh, the, the reason that that analysis has not been carried through is because it's a very complicated analysis, it's very messy, and only recently people have been uh, going after it. So very, in the last few years, Papalo and Rial, um, studying the issue of uh, well-posedness of this theory under some uh, initial conditions, basically conclude that unless G4 in this thing and G5 are zero, the problem will invariably be ill pose. Of course, to establish that result, they need to do the analysis in a special frame and people immediately counter argue, say, well, maybe that analysis relies on a very particular gauge. Could this be regarded as too restrictive? It's not clear uh, necessarily that the problems they, they brought up will be generic. And of course, that depends on what your bias is, where you might want to believe that the problem is generic or you can just dispense it with this uh, question as on the gauge. And I'll illustrate something here. So we did take uh, that theory. Uh, we look at the uh, slightly simpler case. So we thought, said G3 equal to zero, and then you say, well, take that theory. Uh, and then you could do uh, one simple uh, transformation. So you can take, a, you can do a conform, let's see if this works. You can do a conformal transformation with this conformal factor. And if you do that, then one thing you could do is uh, end up in, this, in, in the Einstein frame where now the Ricci tensor has no function of phi whatsoever multiplied to it. So in this case, you had a function of phi that is multiplying uh, the Ricci tensor. And so um, that complicates the analysis in some sense. Uh, but if you go to the, the other frame, which is called the Einstein frame, you end up with a, with a theory where the Einstein's equations are uh, essentially unchanged. Oh, I just lost my course. Well, I don't know where it is. Well, you end up with the theory and you can see in, the, in equation nine, um, the equations of motion are the, in the left-hand side, the Einstein tensor with some source. Uh, and then you have an equation of motion for the scalar field, um, which is given by this. So the first thing to notice here is the following. So the Einstein tensor has a, uh, a right-hand side that involves no uh, secondary resistance scalar field. So by, un by all intent purposes, this is uh, not part of the uh, principal part of the equation. And so the Einstein's equations can be analyzed just as in general activity. 
all the dynamics, all the uh, uh, complicated physics, physics is uh, containing the uh, equation of motion for the, for the scatter field. So let's just focus on that one. So now, okay, here it is. So now we have just simply rearranged the terms, took all the second derivatives and put in the left hand side. And you can see that now your equation of motion for this, for the, uh, for the scatter field, the second order, the principal part, it's like it's obeying an equation of motion on a metric that has been changed. So it's an effective metric that knows about the dynamics of the scatter field itself. And you can ask, will these general equations uh, give rise to well-behaved solutions? The question here or the issue is particularly this term. So now you have in the metric, something that, that depends on the gradient of the scatter field, multiplying the second derivative of the scatter field. Mathematical theory of PDEs will tell you these equations will generically have shocks. And if you have a shock, then it's not clear what the solution is after the shock unless you impose further, further conditions. Uh, so now we landed into this problem. So how do we know this equation will give rise to a sensible theory? Um, so fortunately we can make use in the, in the, in, in the small data regime, we can make use of, of many theorems uh, and, and results from mathematics uh, of PDE. So if, and there are some, I won't go into that, but there are theorems by Klein, Kleinerman and some very strong conjectures, uh, with strongly supported conjectures by Strauss, that basically will say, assuming you have a field that is very sufficiently small, then this will give rise to a well-behaved uh, solution. No shocks will arise and then you'll be fine. But if the scatter field has a larger gradient to begin with, um, or the scatter field develops a large grain to, be to begin with, uh, it's not clear what's gonna happen. So let me show you what may happen. So we took a very simple case, and this is in collaboration with uh, Laura Bernard and Raymond Luna. So you take a case where the only thing that is alive is this contribution. And then you uh, implement everything numerically to be able to study the full nonlinear problem. And then you ask what's going on with that effect, effective metric and where at some point you develop issues. So of course, if you have a regime because we knew from these theories a weak, a weak field regime where you have, and in the initial data, this is in the context of spherical symmetry. We set up the, this initial uh, scatter profile to be smooth and very small in amplitude. So it, it's very, its gradients are significantly constrained. Everything is fine. This scatter field goes in, implodes to the origin, disperses away and, and all is good. However, if you then consider cases where the, um, sorry, this is not good. So whether uh, the, the, the gradient is, is larger just because you make the amplitude larger or uh, you make the, the pulse narrower, then at some point you will see, and this is what we see in the bottom set of plots, is the uh, characteristic speeds of the problem. So the characteristic speeds just diverge. So it's just telling you that in this theory, the speed of propagation of the scatter field is going to infinity. For the case where the coupling is given by, uh, say, a, a positive value, so it's minus x squared. Given that you study the negative case, we might as well study the positive case and then ask what's happening there. Again, for the weak case, uh, for the weak case, all is good. So this, the very same behavior is shown here as before. The pulse goes in, disperse away to infinity without leaving, uh, doing anything nasty. For the other problem, now if you increase the amplitude, well, two things can happen. In the rightmost case, a black hole forms, so this would be this case, um, without uh, finding problems in the space time. But as you increase a little bit the amplitude, or if you will, the uh, gradients of the scatter field, then you have a case where the um, characteristic speeds go to zero uh, before um, anything, before a black hole forms. And again, what happens when the characteristic speeds go to zero or to infinity, that's signaling that you're changing the character of equations. The problem is no longer hyperbolic, it's going 
is becoming parabolic at an instance and then going and uh, becoming elliptic. So the character of the equations change and now it's a very big question mark whether you have the, uh, a well-defined uh, problem uh, from a physical standpoint. So let me just first tell you a few general and then we'll explore where this is a, a big problem or not. So in general, uh, what we see in these theories um, is that you might have um, the development of shocks. A shock is a place where the gradient has gone significantly large in principle to infinity. But even before that, you have very generically uh, the equation of motion that was started being hyperbolic in your initial setup uh, going through an elliptic, through, to the elliptic regime. And this has been seen by others as well. So Ripley and Pretorius have been, uh, has seen exactly the same thing in the context of einstein dilatog gauss bonnet theory, which can, can be mapped into this uh, in, within Hornensky. And very, very recently, Paul Figueres and Franca has also seen exactly the same behavior. So let me just illustrate this with the very uh, simple uh, equation that these are called uh, so there are two classes, so imagine you're in 2D, uh, and then you have two variables, Y and X, so imagine Y is, making the, is playing the role of time. But here you have now a velocity, which it goes like Y, or it goes like one over I, or one over Y. So if you imagine Y being time, and you're going this way, at Y equals to zero, then this speed, the trichome, the speed goes to zero, and in the right, hand, in the right side, the, this is the Keldish equation, it's just diverging. In both these cases, you're transitioning to an elliptic regime. Of course, on the, uh, on the side of Y being positive, you have the standard elliptic equation. Um, but in both cases, you've gone through uh, kind of the system becoming singular at Y equal to zero. So the physicists in us might say, well, maybe this is not too big of a deal. We might be able to solve the hyperbolic problem first. If we actually go to the elliptic regime, maybe we can imagine having some sort of boundary conditions wherever. So let's say, I don't know, here, and solve the elliptic problem here, having the uh, hyperbolic problem here solved, and maybe we can find the solution. In fact, again, depending on what your application or your interest in might be, it might be a feature, not a problem. You might say, well, we might need to somehow resolve this issue of uh, homogeneous or the, the, the seemingly homogeneous uh, universe we lived in, well, if we had, and then we have the, the typical horizon problems, but if we have a regime where the, the system actually was elliptic, uh, then because we can communicate effectively at infinite speeds, maybe this is a, something we can exploit. Um, but we have to be careful because this is, even though we went from hyperbolic to elliptic, there was this parabolic regime in between, it's not clear that this problem is well behaved. And luckily, uh, there are some rigorous results on this, and this is Morawitz considered the case for the trichomy equation. So let me just go back. The trichomy equation is the case of the left, is where the equation, the characteristic spins went to zero. And then you're trying to see if we can, if this kind of mock-up uh, drawing here that, uh, that is possible. So what Morawitz was able to establish is, if, is this result which is very puzzling. So imagine you're, this is this boundary region here, is the place where you want to solve your problem. You say, well, I'm gonna allow myself this elliptic side so I can give boundary conditions here. And can I have a unique well behaved solution? And the theorem that Morawitz pro, pro, proved is, well, you could do that as long as you give data on the elliptic region, you give data on this A region here, but you do not specify this piece. This is completely unspecified. It gets, there is a procedure to find in the unique solution here where that solution in that dash, the, the, the behavior of the function, U on that dash region is determined as part of the solution of the problem itself, which from a physicist point of view makes no sense. We, we, we think of initial conditions and then evolving to the future. Um, so we do get, there are problems, uh, where or that there will be initial regimes where this kind of phenomena or this kind of features will show up and how are we going to deal with that? I don't know. Of course, the question that gets turned into really is what sort of initial conditions 
are the ones that get us into trouble and which ones are, would be safe. Of course, at that point you say, well, maybe you recall that initial, an initial condition, this is just a comment, you, so we recall that initial condition with say a very smooth profile of the scalar field might, give, might be perfectly fine, but maybe we want to use this theory in a regime where not only do we have that scalar pulse, but we might have a black hole here. Okay, and black holes have this, uh, they, they have the ability to strongly lens things. So this pulse, as it propagates by this black hole, might become much more narrower in the other side. And something that was initially thought as being tame enough might actually be brought into the really problematic region simply by lensing. So again, uh, the, the, these considerations will have to play, will play a role. But let's say that's as far as, as staying in, se uh, in a second order level is, uh, is concerned. So what if we go beyond second order? Because even these Hornensky theories, you might say, well, I want to interpret them not as a full theory, but as it's the leading piece of a theory that has corrections at higher order, or, but even, or, 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 or through the effective field theory road, we might have written a, th a theory that has higher correcting terms and we want to study them. So regardless of which approach you're taking, you may end up invariably having to consider higher order corrections to whatever you're, the you're working with. Either that theory being generativity plus correction or that theory being Kordensky plus corrections. So what do we do in that regime or in that case? Uh, the problem, as, a, as, as I said before, is that higher order uh, derivatives will introduce all sorts of problems, among them Ostrograsky. So we have to deal with Ostrograsky problems again and other sort of issues that will show up. And the problem is that we're stuck in kind of, uh, I like to think of it in this way. So we have some underlying theory which we have never written. No one, no one has it so far. We have some sort of idea of the type of truncated theory we want to write or we're writing. Um, we want to obtain solutions from that, but then all these theories would have the kind of problems we've been talking about and others. So we have somehow we need to have some work uh, solution, whatever that one is. And from that, we want to extract information that tells us something about the underlying theory. So we are in a, an interesting conundrum and how do we plow ahead? So I'll describe some options that people have been discussing and maybe potential difficulties. So the strategies that people have been working on uh, are primarily two. So one is this one that comes under very different uh, names and there is a bit of abuse of terminology. So I, I just want to establish that um, uh, the, the terminology in some camps are not exactly the same as in others. So I'm gonna call this strategy iteration or perturbation, but some people use the uh, wording uh, reduction of order to, to also say this. So just let's, let's be careful what, what we mean by. So what I say here is that, well, suppose you have a theory that is given by that. Uh, that's your uncorrected theory. Let's say in this case with generativity, but now you have this, this term in here. This term has higher order derivatives on all sorts of uh, potential problems associated to that. So what you do in this case is you solve for a solution of your original problem then stick that solution in the right-hand side and iterate. And of course, the hope is that this iteration will give uh, rise to the correct solution. This has been uh, used um, uh, already in the context of extensions to generativity. Maria, Masha Okunkova and collaborators have been uh, using this approach uh, in the context of dynamical churn Simons and um, Leonardo Gualtieri and collaborators have also been using uh, that in the context of einstein dilaton gauss bonnet Whether this is justified or not, that's a whole different question. And we're gonna try and discuss a little bit about, about that. Uh, another option is something that we have been pursuing for a while is this, where we're gonna modify the equation somehow to try and make sure we, sh we fix the potential problems, but yet we don't throw uh, the baby with the bathwater in the cases in the regime of, the, of long wavelengths, we, might, we still want to capture faithfully what the theory would be telling we should be having here. And I should stress these techniques, in, uh, are, uh, we need to use them or some sort of uh, ideas like this need to be implemented, primarily because we're asking uh, questions 
to the theory in the nonlinear regime. This is a regime where we cannot do calculations with pencil, pe pencil and paper. We cannot rely on uh, the assumptions at the linear level where we might introduce a natural cutoff in the theory. Um, and worse yet, we, at the end of the day, we might have to put everything in a computer and a computer will, will source all possible sources, all possible noise uh, levels at truncation or random level. And that's gonna put a, a constraint on the ability that we have to actually follow that, uh, that problem. And so this is in some sense, it's a mathematical problem that gets exacerbated by the reality of having to use uh, numerical simulations to uh, try and probe for the behavior of the theory. So let me just discuss the first option. And this is the same example I was giving uh, before. Take Navier-Stokes and imagine that you do exactly what that theory says. So you know that Navier-Stokes will have in the right-hand side a term like so, this is simple. For simplicity, I'm considering the incompressible case, but this uh, statement is generic. So this is what um, Navier-Stokes has. This term, seen from an EFT point of view, is precisely what we're talking about. We have a theory, the, the, idea, the perfect fluid case will give us the left-hand side. So we introduce further operators that capture further physics. Uh, then the leading order term is the, the role of viscosity. But if we say, well, let's solve the problem without a higher order operator, then we'll be solving the left-hand side problem. The left-hand side problem has turbulence for absolutely all wavelengths. There's a nonlinear regime. Uh, if you want, and, it, uh, and you know about this, you can compute the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number for eta, which is the viscosity parameter going to zero, is infinity, so all modes are uh, turbulent. So now any perturbative, uh, treatment that you want to use will have to fight turbulent off to give you back the laminar regime that you know should be there uh, for short wavelengths. Uh, and so that's the question. How, how far do you have to carry that perturbation to realize that this physics is going on and maybe if we are uh, very smart or very lucky, we'll be able to resum the solution and out that there is this regime where actually you don't have this uh, turbulent regime and, and identify the laminar, the laminar behavior. Option two is something that uh, was motivated in part by ideas of uh, Israel and Stewart, which precisely deal with the problem I just mentioned. So Israel and Stewart say, well, a minute, those high order term should stay small if we are in the EFT regime. So let's ensure they stay small and by, with an ad hoc equation. So they say, well, in hydrodynamics, say, imagine you're in relativity hydrodynamics, you have your perfect fluid, you write, uh, you, so your fluid, you write as a perfect fluid plus some gradient terms that contain viscosity. If you analyze the equations of motion of that, you find out that you have a cause of propagation and all sort of mathematical uh, uh, problems. So they say, well, let's just ensure by some ad hoc equation that these terms always stay small. This might change the physics, because if, the, if physics wants to run and make those terms large, then you're gonna be changing completely the system of equations, but you're gonna say, well, I'm gonna uh, insist that those terms are small, and by that I'm gonna introduce an equation of motion like so. So I define all the gradient terms into a new variable, and to that variable, I give it an equation of motion that is a decaying uh, exponential to make this new field that I introduce be equal to the leading part of those gradient terms. And if the physics is such that you don't have a runaway into the UV regime, then you shouldn't be changing the physics uh, with this uh, kind of uh, workaround that you're introducing. And if you have signal in the very UV regime, you're killing that. So let me just motivate this with, or show that this is indeed possible with an example. I mean, up to what I just said, uh, this, usually these are just words because in general, the true theory, underlying theory is never been available or in the context of, general, of, of gravity. And the rest is present, the presentation of a truncated theory and techniques to deal with that theory to obtain a work, of, uh, a work example or a work solution. But let's just go to a regime where we have this, uh, we can uh, motivate this with a full problem that we understand. We have the underlying problem, we obtain the truncation, and then we look at the consequences. 
So consider this problem, given with that action, from that action. So these are uh, two scalar fields that are interacting. The equations of motion, which are given by these, you can recognize there is a box here and you, there is another box coming here, says that both fields, theta and rho, propagate at the speed of light and there is a non-trivial coupling in between the two of them. The field rho is sensitive potential with a given scale given by the mass. So you might say, well, if I'm looking at the heavy uh, regime, so I can, I can find out what the interaction, what this true solution for rho is, because the theta is coming along for a ride as far as rho is concerned, iterate it out and plug the solutions back into the action and obtain a modified action. And that's, that's what you have here. So this is a modified action where you have iterated out the scale, the degrees of freedom associated with rho. What you do or what you buy or with that uh, is these extra terms. So these two extra terms, and of course this can keep going, but now we change significantly the equations of motion and the equations of motions are this. To leading order, you have the wave equation for, sorry, and at this point, phi became, theta became phi. So, uh, sorry, my bad, I, I'm taking uh, pieces of two different uh, talks. So theta is, so the leading part is this, but then the role of rho implicitly uh, coming in introduces these higher order terms. So the first is just a wave equation. The second term, which goes to a scale of one over m squared, notice that it now has gradients multiplying the secondary of the scalar field, which will change the equations of motion uh, in a significant way. So as now the scalar field doesn't propagate at the speed of light anymore, as it was originally, it's propagating at a speed that is sensible to what phi is doing, which again, can give trouble. But we're gonna say, well, let's stick to that one. If, let's ignore the one over m to the fourth as a higher correction. Let's just find out what the solutions of those are. Because we have the original problem, we can find out what the true solution is. And let's use each one of the two methods I described to see if we can reproduce or how well we can reproduce the solution. Uh, sorry, the, the slide is a bit blurry, but uh, what this is just illustrating is the full solution uh, compared with the, what I call the iterated scheme or the solution uh, given by this uh, fixing of equations at the a, a Israel store. And if the scale of M is sufficiently large, they are all doing a pretty good job. So you can barely see the numbers, but this is just the errors. The errors are, are kind of small uh, and the solutions are more or less the same. But if you now decrease the value of M, uh, so now the scale is, is, is is stronger, uh, the effects of the corrections are stronger, very quickly after some time, the iterative scheme just uh, not only loses track of the solutions, it just begins to blow up. While the other one, where you, where you fix the scheme, you modify the equations, you can get a solution that is well behaved, but depending on this one ad hoc extra parameter, you may be dissipating a bit too much. And I'll, bring, I'll, I'll say something more about that in, in, in a bit. Um, so my takeaway from that, and, and I'm not taking anything away from that method, is if I'm going to choose something to do, I'll choose the other method, the, the, the second option, because I, I think I have better control. I understand better how uh, the different physical effects are coming in and, and how I can go about testing if the solution is sensible, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain some more. The option one, I'm very happy that people are exploring it. I want to know what the answer uh, are, um, but it tells me, this analysis tells me that it might be delicate or uncertain how far away, how far do I have to carry the, part of the perturbative approach or iterative approach to uh, be able to say with confidence, this is the solution I'm expecting. But regardless, either you choose option one or option two, uh, there seem to be at least a very a practical or some practical way to try and asking questions. Of course, remember I said, well, the physics better uh, go with you. In both options, one and two, if they're gonna give a, a very sensible, a sensible solution, what the physics should be saying is that you shouldn't be having a runaway or, or a very strong cascade of your signal into, or your solution into UV regime. Because at the UV regime, very, a lot of energy in, in short wavelengths, um, 
the, uh, the corrections that you brought in as under the assumption of the EFT as being small are getting very, very, very large. So you're very far from the regime of applicability of the EFT. However, I think we can take uh, comfort on a lot of interesting uh, observations. Of course, the, uh, the ultimate uh, observation is that LIGO, Virgo uh, observations are not showing a significant amount of energy cascading to shorter wavelengths. By and large, everything stays within the wavelengths that are natural to the problem. Remember, if we were something, if we were having something akin to turbulence in three plus one dimensions, you would put some amount of energy in a given wavelength, and that energy wants to cascade to very, very, very short wavelengths till it gets dissipating, dissipated in heat ultimately at the kind of molecular uh, scale. We're not seeing that with LIGO. So somehow gravity in three plus one seems to be behaving that way. Also, we have had from, uh, if you uh, know this, uh, this fine, if not, then you can think of the membrane paradigm. In general relativity, you can uh, kind of make a, a, an analogy of the Einstein equations near the horizon using membrane arguments. And these membrane arguments let you uh, map Einstein's equations in three plus one dimensions to hydrodynamics equations in two plus one dimensions. And that's a very interesting result. Two plus one turbulence, two plus one uh, hydro dimensions hydrodynamic turbulence cascade in the opposite direction mainly. You put energy in a given wavelength, most of that energy will go to longer and longer wavelengths. So this is a regime where any modification uh, will never get very large because energy is going to longer wavelengths. So if you introduce corrections that are very sensitive to the short wavelength features of your solution, uh, not enough energy is going there and these correcting terms will stay small. Will this be generic? I don't know, but so far the evidence seems to be saying that this is probably uh, the case. So just a, as, a, a, as a, a conclusion, I'll show you the, the last application, and this is an application of the, the not a, in a toy model, uh, it's in a simpler system, but in, in a higher dimension, in a higher derivative theory. Um, so this is a theory that was introduced uh, some years ago by Leonardo Senatori and uh, uh, Yu Wu Wan and collaborators, where using different arguments from EFT and assuming that you're in vacuum, you can argue that the corrections to, uh, from an EFT point of view to, to Einstein's ten, the Einstein uh, Hilbert action will be model, modulated by terms like uh, the Riemann tensor square square. So this is the type of scale they, they would uh, argue would be the natural leading order corrections to general relativity. Uh, I should say it also that Claudia de Ram and Andrew Tully very recently put a paper saying, well, that might be true in the context of vacuum, but in, if you were in the context of, if, if matter were to be allowed, you have lower order corrections as well. That wouldn't scale this way, but it would be lower. But we take, took the theory simply to just test the method because this will give you high order. In fact, the equations of motions that are in, say in equation two, you see that for instance, you have the second derivative of, uh, of the Riemann tensor, um, which already has second derivatives. So this, you have very high order derivatives in this problem that you have to deal with. And again, unless you introduce a particular method to deal with them, uh, this, this will blow up in a very short time. So, uh, Ramiro Caruso has been working with this. A recent a paper has been put recently in the archive. So uh, for, to simplify the application, this was the context of spherical symmetry coupled with the scalar field. So as to have some interesting dynamic, you pick up many of these high derivative terms. You have to introduce all possible sort of um, handling on that. So you have high order derivatives of high order time derivatives, which can then rewrite in terms of spatial derivatives so as to have uh, equations of motion have second order even times and very high derivatives in space. And then you treat those high order derivatives in space using the technique I, I briefly mentioned. And with that, you get interesting behaviors. In particular, the top plot shows the horizon growth for a case where you had initially a small black hole, uh, say of size one with scalar field falling in. As you expect from general relativity, epsilon equal to zero is general relativity you would have, you should see the, uh, the horizon growing and then asymptoting to a stationary solution. But as you increase the value of the coupling, you see, some, you see something very interesting. So in particular, 
So first, let me just, this was the largest coupling we looked. So initially, the solution is, is uh, chosen to be time symmetric, so there's a transient, so that growth is fine. And it grows in the right direction, the area is getting larger. But look at here, the, the area has gone down a little bit before it goes up. So this, from the point of view of general relativity, is completely not only unexpected, but it's wrong. You don't, you know, area should not decrease. But this is a different theory. And this, this theory with this extra term actually violates the null convergence condition. Uh, and this is what is uh, the, illustrated in the bottom plot. The bottom plot just shows the null convergence condition in the regime of the case that is violating it the least. And you see that uh, you're violating so the, uh, the, the condition. So it's not surprising that uh, yearly, uh, year known facts from generativity are not necessarily carried through in, uh, in other theories, which is something to, be, uh, to keep in mind uh, when deciding potential phenomenological searches in, in, in LIGO. Uh, he can also extract the quasional modes and the quasional modes, even though that picture uh, here illustrating the behavior of the scalar field at the extraction radius uh, is, doesn't seem to be very, very different. You can estimate what the corrections are and the corrections are in this, in this front. And in principle, if this epsilon is sufficiently large, it should be, it would be observable. Of course, what it would turn out to be the case more is that one would put constraints on these scales. And that's what I think would happen in the future. LIGO and future uh, detectors, if I have to bet, I will bet that they will not be seeing significant departures. In fact, they might not see any departures at all. And one will just end up putting uh, stricter and stricter constraints in any, in any of these viable theories or these interesting uh, alternative theories. So let me just conclude here. In some sense, I, what I just told you, is, told you is a bit of a, of, a, of a trip that I took in this front. Uh, initially, whenever I saw one of these theories, I said, this is nonsense. That would have been my, my, my first reaction because I would see all the, pro the problems there. Slowly, as I started studying more and more, I, I, I saw the value and the interesting ideas that these theories will have in the back but I still keep seeing the problem and, and saying, okay, how will we ever confront this with observations in the regime where we have nonlinearity plays playing a strong role? role. Um, and slowly started getting kind of turned into, well, maybe some of the theories will be interesting, will be viable, but in very particular regimes. So, not, so I think in my mind, the question is not so much as is this theory uh, viable and interesting. The question is more, is this theory viable and interesting within this regime or this particular set of initial con configurations that for whatever reason we think are interesting. Um, and it is in those cases that we have to study them. And if we can conclude that in those cases, the theory is well behaved, then there is a way to plow ahead. These techniques that I described will still be necessary because going to the computer will always be the case that because you're seeding via truncation round of error all possible extra features it might be it might very well be the case that within some very restricted or some sort of restrictive initial configurations the theory is fine at the mathematical level but when you put that in the computer you might have small seeds that are outside that regime and those seeds will take away because the equation the system the theory has these pathologies so we need something to take that, control those potential problems to begin to potentially ask questions to these theories. And with that, I think I'm gonna, oh, I'm just gonna mention one last thing um, because I, I did uh, say that I would comment on that. Suppose you have a theory where it wants to go to the UV. What in the world do you do? So this is actually the people have been working at uh, even in, con in confronting experimental data. So in the context of quark glue and plasma, people are using this, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics to go and check whether this deconfined um, regime that gets produced with the high energy collision of, uh, in, in accelerators can be described by uh, hydrodynamics. And surprisingly, it turns out to be uh, that it, it seems possible. But I mentioned that you have a theory that is non-sensible because it's a causal and has all these problems. So people are implementing this rather steward. This 
collision gives rise to three plus one hydrodynamics where energy is flowing to the UV. And so when you apply this rail steward, this external parameter tau, which is a time scale over which you're trying to drive this new variable to uh, approach the original uh, set of variables of your original problem, um, does play a role. So they actually solve for that several variables of this parameter and they see to within what regime they can more or less trust the solution. So the bottom, the, the message of this is to say, even when this theory might go to the UV in a very strong way, the idea uh, of this fixing these equations might still give you a way to get a sense, a sense of what this uh, solution should be doing and hopefully contrast with observations. But that was uh, maybe a bit uh, too far of a piece of information, but I think it's important to, to, to put that in, uh, in context. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Luis, very nice talk. So, is there any questions for the speaker? Go ahead. Miguel, uh, it's Enrico here. I have a couple of questions. So you, at some point during the talk, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, uh, that in GR you can uh, you mentioned the singularity theorem and that some initial data can give rise to uh, to singularities. So uh, I'm not sure I quite understood the point. Are you saying that uh, we should uh, uh, we should consider putting constraints on what initial data would be viable in modified? Gravity. So in GR, if that's the case, in GR is different, right? Because uh, we know that singularities uh, are typically protected by event horizons, which might not be the case uh, beyond uh, beyond GR. Right. Okay. So the, 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 that statement or, or that that, that uh, point I made has several uh, consequences. So so let's start on one end. So it's the. So the first one is to say, when we build these extensions of GR, which by fiat or well, well, by, by the pressure uh, of observations that we already have, we already know that those corrections in this regime of black holes should not be playing a significant role. Mm -hmm. So we have to, but however, people com com complaining about these theories among them myself at the very beginning would have, would have said, wait a minute, if you put those corrections, things will blow up. You have no way of knowing that that's a priori, that that's not possible because you might start with a regime where those things are sufficiently small, but we know that the back, the, kind of the leading edge, the leading part of the theory, which is general activity, has regimes where it cascades to the UV and it gives you a singularity. So now your corrections would either have, so either they are magical, in that they would prevent that from happening. They will, uh, they're, they are either magical from that point of view, or they will also have built into it a very strong censorship uh, component, like uh, the, the existence of black holes uh, in, in general. Even let's assume that that's a, that's a fact. But it may very well be the case that neither happens, that neither is true, uh, that you have within some sort of regime uh, with conditions that are sufficiently interesting, uh, they are well behaved. And so maybe this, because they, they come also new scales come in. So it might be that these black holes come and censor you, right, with the scales uh, of this, the, 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 of the type of kind of solar system, so solar mass scales. But it may be, may be very, very, very different if you go to much smaller scales. In fact, it should be very different. So the, the, the comment there is to say, well, we either will have to assume or hope that some sort of censorship will always, or in the regime that we're interested in, will, will, will turn on. Or it might very well be that it, within these regimes, dispersion in that theory uh, wins. It, it wants to not significantly cascade to the UV. Because if it does, then this, we are outside the EFT uh, uh, assumptions and we really don't know what we're talking about. We don't have the tools to say these terms, these extra terms have been added in are corrections, which okay, so added under I, that I, assumption. So this comment then was not, because I, I thought of this comment when you talked about KSS, uh, in which you have some initial data that give you a cabbage type or a type. 
equation. Right. But, but the, that failure of the Cauchy problem is not due to, to, to UV physics, right? So it's not... Uh, well, I it's not you can no, fix it uh, you can fix it uh, with the, the tricks you you explain later about the israel stewart well uh, okay good thanks for that question so in some that's again we have to be uh, mindful of two things so so if the so failure of the uh, the hyperbolic problem is a consequence of significant energy going to uv and uh, so one comment is it could very well be the case that some sort of initial configurations because the elliptic, the, because dispersion kind of wins, we don't go there. We never have developed sufficiently high uh, gradients and the theory is perfectly fine. That, that we know and there's a theorem that you can prove, right? So or, or, or someone like Kahneman can, can prove uh, naturally. Um, I w so there I had one comment there. I said, well, wait a minute, you may say that for the scalar field, but you also need to be mindful of what, are, what everything else is happening. So if I put a black hole, now lensing might take me there and then I, I'm out. But I don't know a priori because mathematicians have yet to get there. <laughs> and those of us that are close to the, mud, the mucky trenches, we still need to try and get a solution. So then my very practical or very pragmatic way would be, okay, you introduce a fixing uh, kind of a strategy that will prevent the theory from blowing up. So how would you know that now you have modified the physics and the physics you're getting is not the one you introduced by you trying to correct something, but instead it's the true behavior that that theory is telling you. Well, that's, and this is the last comment. So the, the, this fixing introduces a time scale. This is this tau. There's a time scale over which you're trying to make this correction be faithful to the original system of equation. If your solution depends very sensitively on that tau, then you're out of luck. You're, you're, you're saying, okay, I'm getting the physics of the problem I'm solving. I'm not getting the physics of the original problem I had. But what would I do is precisely what you were saying. I would use that fixing term. I would uh, evolve forward and try and see if this, uh, if, if this, the, how robust the solution I'm obtaining is upon variations of the tau. And I should say this, the student I have, Guillaume Dideron, well, not, student that is working with me, Guillaume, is doing precisely that with Kordensky theories. In precisely the same kind of uh, question, uh, problems we uh, studied before with, with Luna and, and Bernard. And by using this technique, he's, he's being able to show that uh, things are okay, are well behaved. So now we're trying to see how much of that solution is robust and you can take home and, and say some, do something with it. Uh, so are you applying then this uh, Israel Stewart technique to the very same K essence theory or are you putting higher order terms? Because I easily see why, because I thought that dissipative uh, hydrodynamics uh, analogy or technique was useful when you had higher order terms. The, for K essence, your equations are already second order, right? So right, you don't... But, um, no, but the, the physics is still the same. So it's, it's, you're controlling the, 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 the flow to the higher to the UV. Mm -hmm. So he's doing precisely that on a second order theory. Because remember, so the term is, the problem is this, your, whoops. Where was it? Uh, oh no. Here. So the problem is how different is this, oh, can you see my person? No, no, I, I could see it a second ago. Well, let's say in the first line you have the wave equation. The second one is these gradient terms that are multiplying your second derivatives. So you can change all these into a new variable. And then that variable is the one you're saying, oh, it shouldn't, or if you want the difference between the speed of, propagation of the first line versus the effective speed of propagation of the second line. And you can do that again with a time scale that you introduce and this whole second terms becomes a new variable. And you, that will make sure it's more sensitive. If you do not then now do a free analysis or, or a frequency analysis, you see you're affecting the high frequency parts much yeah. more strongly than the low frequency parts. And in, in, in effect, it's doing exactly the same type of work. I see. Okay, no, that's interesting. I hadn't understood that. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, is there any question? Someone else? I would have a question. <clears throat> uh, it's me, Sebastian. Uh, so first of all, it was a very interesting overview talk, also because I was, um, well, still not familiar with some of the techniques you mentioned, but if I understood it correctly, the, um, in some part of your talk, you explained that there are techniques that use data, let's say observations from LIGO in principle, to build theories or constrained theories. Um, is that so far correct, what I understood? So I, I would say both. So, so what has been done? So there are theories that are out there and people have been motivating potential searches uh, for uh, LIGO Virgo observations. So this makes sense The PPE, the parameterized Ponsenstanian framework that uh, Pretorius and Yunus introduced, relies on taking theories, finding solutions in each of these theories in very specialized regime, but from there motivating potential uh, phenomenological modifications of the waveforms, and then trying to put constraints on that. So in some sense, that's something where theory has informed some of the search. The other one is you could then, there are these uh, phenol searches like what the Tiger team has been doing, Bertie and collaborators, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of names here, where you now say, well, let me just look for any potential de uh, uh, de departures from general activity, and then you put some constraint on that, and then you turn around and say, okay, what can this tell me about different theories? Um, so I think, okay, I'm not sure I'm, if I'm answering your, your question. Okay, I think correct. all, all, yeah. all things are being tried. Okay, because my question then is, uh, just first want to make sure I understood correctly, is so you're actually in the second case, I mean, it's a very general inverse problem, right, where you have some observations and you would not expect that there's a unique answer for what theory will do the job in principle, especially if you add, uh, say, uncertainties. So my, my question is how, I mean, how bad is the situation if you if want to very agnostic and say, I don't want to make very specific assumptions about the theory, how much can I constrain using using data of all the available theories, different initial data, different maybe meta configurations, which could be there. Oh, uh, you're probably asking uh, to one of the most chromogenous persons on this front. I, th I, think, I think we're ex so far, but in some sense, because this work has just started. Um, so there's, uh, the, the, this is a line of opportunity, I would say. I mean, these are the very first attempts. There are other things that one could try and do. So for instance, I have a comment here. You could imagine trying to be slightly more, well, let me say, let me just backtrack a little bit. One problem I would say is that there is not a theory out there that is an extension to generativity that anyone that has not written it or for whatever reason been put to work in it can defend over anyone else, any other theory, right? Of course, the moment I say this, I'm sure people that may be in the audience or maybe elsewhere will come and, and, and try to choke me to death. But I would argue those are probably people that for whatever reason they were working on a particular theory. There's no theory that has somehow stood up above the noise. Uh -huh. uh, all theories in some sense are at the same level of noise. There are some theories that are very, very um, appealing and have been uh, very interestingly applied in the context of cosmology. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these, because maybe you want to uh, go through a bounce and uh, try to avoid the big bang, or maybe because you want to a natural dynamical way to try and explain the cosmological constant. I love those ideas. I think they are great. When we go to the, um, and, but I also uh, put that caveat. The, the, most of the studies have been done in that context have been in the context of linearized studies. And I'm not sure where those answers are the answers of the theory. They are the answers of the linearized theory, of the full theory, I have no idea. In the context of black hole collisions, of neutron stars collisions, I, I think the, everything is still to be worked. So it's a, it's a land of opportunities, an empty canvas, and someone would go. Um, I'm, I'm, I tend to be very conservative, so I would think uh, my take would be either a theory, so I'm not smart enough to be the one that writes that theory, I, I'm pretty sure I, of that. Uh, so unless some theory comes up way above the noise for a particular reason, I tend to think that my take will be more, let's see what the data is telling us. If there is a particular bias in a particular direction, 
uh, then we're going to have to understand what sort of theories, what or what particular properties a theory should have to give a bias in that direction, and then that's where I'll begin to work. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe one more question. Uh, can, can I ask a quick question, please? Because uh, and thanks a lot for the for the talk. Uh, I was very happy until uh, the very end when now you were replying to Sebastian. And I that, <laughs> yeah, and um, you comment about the, the application of this uh, modification of gravity to cosmology, let's say, where you only only care about the linear, the linear theory, linearization. But now, if we restrict to to your case of the truncation, basically you are exploring the same regime, because. Uh, um, if you go away from the linear regime, then you need to include all the terms that uh, you are truncating in your expansion. Indeed, if you go to the slide that you showed before uh, to Enrico, the one in which you make the connection uh, uh, between the, the two scalar field and then the, um, oh, yeah. you, okay. you integrate out one field, exactly this one here. So you start with the, with the first action when, uh, where you have a two scalar field. You integrate one out and then you get uh, uh, the second action in terms of theta. But now you see from here, uh, if you are in the linear regime, okay, the, the second term, the d theta to the fourth over m squared, let's say, has to be taken linearly. Because as soon as you go to uh, the nonlinear regime of the theta field, then you cannot forget the, the third term. And then you cannot forget a, a fourth term, a fifth, and all the expansion. Because in, in the linear regime, so let's say inside the validity of the effective field theory, where all these one, these are all irrelevant operators. So as long as you are in a perturbative regime, these are all, let's say, not negligible, but let's say they are perturbative. So you can, uh, you can trust the linear theory. So basically it's a linear theory. But as long as you enter in the nonlinear regime, you have to include them all. Because in the nonlinear regime, the, the third term is going to be important as the second and it's to be important as the first. Well, so I, I, I agree with that statement, but the, the, the statement is relative to, res, to the solution you are doing the uh, expansion with respect to. So one thing, so if I, if I were to think of it in the context of, um, let's say, so I could do phi equal to zero, phi to a constant, mm -hmm. but I could, I could have any phi, any phi that, it, that I can imagine that is a solution of, say, if you want the first equation, the box phi equal to zero, I can have a big blob that is moving uh, to the left with uh, the, the speed of light. And then I say, okay, I'm gonna, then it's a perturbation of, with respect to that one. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a difference, so I agree. In cosmology, so if I put aside the, the, the question, so which is not a criticism, but it's a question, is linearized, linearization stability true? Let's assume it is true. So there, there's a lot of work that has been done in the context of perturbations of, with respect to FRW. We don't know if perturbations with respect to curve will satisfy the same properties. So we might end up with a, a set of problems uh, or, or, or features that are in one case, but not the other one. I'll, I'll give you one example. There is a paper written by my friends and I give them always a hard time. And the paper says something like Dynam dynamical churn Simons is okay in the linearized regime. What did they do there? They analyzed perturbations of linearized Chern Simons with respect to Minkowski and Schwarzschild in Schwarzschild coordinates. So unfortunately, every single observing of offending term in that case happens to evaluate to zero <laughs> in those two cases. Now, if you imagine that you're, it's not Schwarzschild in Schwarzschild coordinates, just fake, make some, some gauge dependent uh, radial coordinate. Uh, those terms will be there and you, you'd, they would have seen that this thing has blowing up solutions. So I, I totally take your point. I, we don't know in general. So we first of course have to start with a scenario, which is now very strongly um, imposed upon us uh, by observations, where a black hole looks like a black hole in GR by on internal purposes, and if there are corrections, they are tiny, they're small. The question is, will they stay small? And we don't even know how, we, unless you use one of these techniques, we don't even know how to answer that question, I would argue. And then, the, what I'm saying, the, those are, this is a roadblock. And then potential potentials way through is to say, well, use one of these techniques, and if you ask the right question, the answer to that question will say, Maybe you can try six or you know what, you, you can't. 
So I think we're saying the same thing. I'm not sure if you. If you okay, thanks. No, it's more clear. Then. Okay, thanks again, Luis, for this very nice seminar. So yeah, I think more than enough for the question. So let's see next week, or if there is any question on someone, I don't know. But thanks a lot, Luis. Well, thanks to you guys. Happy to. Okay. Thank you, Luis. Glad to see everyone is doing fine.